I'm so excited to be here with all of you today. I am an amazing event on diversity and inclusion today. And I have three amazing guests that are going to join us. Um, so very excited to um, join all of you. So um, I'm going to bring my guests to stage um, in just one second. Uh, and I'm going to bring to stage uh, Natalie Marino. Uh, how are you doing today, Natalie? Hi, good morning. I'm doing wonderful. And yourself? So glad to have you today, Natalie. I'm doing well. Thank you. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, I'm, I'm so glad that we are uh, actually uh, hosting this event today. I'm going to bring to stage Zuri Goffrey, uh, who's going to join us. Um, maybe I didn't buy. Hey, Zuri, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Can't complain. I'm over in Cali, so it's an early start of my morning, but it will be well worth it for sure. So looking forward to the conversation. Amazing, amazing. So happy to have you today and um, so excited to discuss this topic with all of you. I'm pretty sure most of our audience is going to relate to what we are going to uh, discuss today. Um, we're coming from most of us from, from big tech company or a startup and um, we all feel the same way. So <laughs> let's share the, the thoughts out there and being awareness that we all need to feel included in this amazing world that is diverse. I'm going to bring to stage um, Jessica Mercedes. How are you doing today, Jessica? Hi, everyone. I am great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to have you, Jessica. We have a few, a few um, uh, people joining us. Let's say hello to them. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Please let us know where you're joining us from. <laughs> And we would love to um, say hi to you and answer any questions you may have about the topic or anything that we can help out on. We're going to start by introducing ourselves. Natalie, uh, please tell us a little bit about you. Thank you, Elvie. Um, a little bit about me. I'm Natalie Marino. I'm currently a senior product owner with ADP, so I work for a big corporation. Um, I started in technology um, by way of HR. Um, that has pretty much been my niche for my entire career and professional employer organizations. Um, and I've been in technology for about maybe the last 10 years or so of my career. Um, it's been very exciting, um, and it is something that I, I, you know, I pull my my passion and my soul to as well. Thank you, thank you for that introduction. Uh, so we work for big corporations in the in the technology sector. We are women and we are diverse. So <laughs> a lot of things to discuss in that regard, Natalie. <laughs> thank you so much for joining. Um, Zurin, could you please introduce yourself? Tell us Absolutely. a little bit about you. Yep, so born and raised in Hampton, Virginia in moved to DC for undergrad, went to Howard, studied business management and was a student athlete. Was able to have an internship with PwC and consultant with Google and brand strategy and with ESPN and sports marketing. And I bring those up because I'm a recent grad. I graduated last year, May, 2021. And so now I'm full time as an associate product marketing manager at Google, where I, I lead our social media strategy for our biggest line of business, which is Google Ads, our most revenue driving business, I should say. And yeah, I'm based in the Bay, live in Oakland and work in San Francisco. Excited to be here. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's impressive that you just graduated, basically, and you are working for Google. And <laughs> kudos to you. Thanks. Um, let's let's share some insights for people who are in the audience. They may ask any questions. Please let us know if you have any questions for either Natalie, Zuri, or Jessica. We are just gonna dive in. Um, uh, Zuri, what do you think uh, diversity is important? Yeah, I think it's important from two two facets. One from a business perspective and then also from an ethical perspective so leading with the business the business cases diversity is business critical and when i say diversity i'm not merely speaking about 
race, but I'm also talking about gender. I'm also talking about the different intersectionalities that is of diversity. And so it's, it's proven that having a more diverse, equitable and inclusive company team and work culture leads to better and greater business outcomes. So that's the business side of it. And then ethically, when you think about the world at large and think about us as humans, everyone wants a seat at, at the table and a seat at the table isn't, isn't enough. Everyone wants a voice, everyone wants input. And so from an ethical perspective, everyone should have that seat at the table, but also have that, that stance to be able to contribute and to voice ideas and uh, innovation as it pertains to the technology industry. So I'll be brief with that. For me, it's a business case, but it's also something that we should be thinking through mm -hmm. from an ethical perspective. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Suri. Uh, uh, Jessica, why do you think diversity is important? Of course. So for me, I divided it into like five quick bullet points. The first one is what you already said, that is like the greater market appeal, which is you, when you have a diverse and tech industry, it's more likely to produce products that service that and that appeals to a wider range of customers and users. But also like when you improve representation and inclusivity, it embraces uh, diversity in, in tech that ensures that the industry benefits and reflects the diversity of the population that it, it is serving. So we have all like seen the cases of bathroom soap dispensers, right? That don't identify people of color. So for me, it's like, how can you tailor something? Can you, how can you create a product for certain someone when that certain someone is not part of your team? Um, then you have that it enhances creativity and also problem solving. So when you have a diverse team, it brings a range of perspective and experiences to the table that can lead to more creativity and more innovation, more solutions to problems. It also improves the company culture. Um, it can in, it lead to improve employer satisfaction and retention. And lastly, it creates a social responsibility. When you embrace diversity in tech, it's a way of companies to demonstrate that their commitment to social responsibility and to contribute to creating a more equitable um, society. So th that's why I believe that it is very important to have um, inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. And Nathalie? I mean, you guys hit the nail on all the heads, right? I think that uh, a lot of the times, you know, Jessica, you mentioned how can we create good products and good services, you know, in just in our space, but think about all the other industries in the world. If you aren't taking a look at, every, you know, different populations from different sides of, uh, you know, of humanity itself. And then a big component is, you know, the ROI piece of things, like actually generating good revenue from a lot of different facets of individuals. Um, like if we build great product, but also build great product that other people can also utilize, well, of course, your revenue margins go way up. So it, I think that companies are now starting to realize how important it is to have an equitable and diverse um, group of people working for them as well. I love that you mentioned that because uh, I, my biggest example is the movie Encanto. <laughs> like the Beautiful movie, movie. Encanto <laughs> hit the market. I mean, it is an amazing movie. I lived in Colombia for like Lo seven love the movie. years. So I'm like, I'm like half <laughs> Colombian already. <laughs> <laughs> For me, Encanto is, is that way to tell people like, hey, there is this whole lot of people that you are not representing. That mm -hmm. look how they moved and how much they spend just because you created one movie for them. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you start creating movies for all the other people who, who, who are not seen. Moana, uh, Tiana and the Frog. For mm -hmm. me, those movies are amazing because it finally is like, hey... We're here and we deserve to be, you know, to see yourself in the big screen too. Uh, it's amazing that you say that because when I saw the Encanto movie, I, I, I saw myself in Mirabel. I saw my oh my yeah, hair. Right. I saw my my skin color. Um, I don't have the glasses, glasses now, but I saw Me my too. glasses too. 
I, I could see myself in that. And I said, oh, I, I, I like to be part of that. I feel mm -hmm. included when I, when I watched that movie. I felt included. Yep. Exactly. This war is diverse. And the products that we build need to be diverse because otherwise they are not going to serve a diverse, uh, challenging world that we're living in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another quick example is actually the uh, Little Mermaid. For the first time, there was a, oh. a black, a black actress. Oh my god, the controversy! Oh. Yeah, it was definitely controversial, but uh, I'm glad we're making strides in, in all industries. Yeah, amazing. Diversity is is a win win, isn't it? Uh, it's a win for the company. It's a win for the customers. It's it's a win for the entire world. Well, when we all feel included, we can innovate. We can uh, we feel empowered to to mm -hmm. uh, create things that are not even possible uh, in, in our minds sometimes. But when we come together, different backgrounds, different ideas, different thoughts, different per perspectives, or maybe um, just a different way of doing things that we all that when we come together and put all of that together, amazing innovations come to place. So. Uh, this is why diversity and inclusion is not just a nice to have, it's a must have for companies to survive in this in this world that we're living in that is actually 100% diverse. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from the audience and um, any of you can jump in probably help me answer that. How can uh, human resources um, work towards hiring more under, underrepresented groups? Um, thank you so much, Hansa Khan, for asking that question. How can HR um, make sure and ensure that more underrepresented groups are higher? And I will even go a little bit farther, not only higher, also feel included, because if you if you leave that and you just hire them, they're going to leave sooner or later because they're not going to feel like they're part of it. Mm -hmm. I think HR... Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Jessica. Oh. So real quick, that's something that we at Dear One, um, it's the startup that I'm working for, we try to help. Um, so for me, HR cannot be reactive and be like, oh, we're, ju we, we're just going to post this job description and hope that people from underrepresented backgrounds apply. They need to be proactive into actually go into the places that these candidates are and actually inviting them to go through the process one because we all know and that it's something that happened unconscious bias is something that it's right there right um, and also we have a lot of also sound bias which is like imposter syndrome most underrepresented candidates when they see a position unless they um meet 100% of the bullet points in that job description, they won't, they won't apply because they already think that they are at loss are already applying. So mm -hmm. when, if you proactively as HR, of the person that is hiring for a company, go to a underrepresented, like a boot camp, for example, or to a community of underrepresented uh, candidates, then, and you actually invite them to apply, and you basically remove obstacles, remove filters for them to actually get into the process, then I think that that's what they should be doing instead of just wishful mm -hmm. thinking. It's like, because a lot of people will just post a job and be like, oh, it's just that no woman apply, no uh, people of color apply. Of course, because you're not one, you're making a, a bunch of filters that is basically mm -hmm. blocking them to apply. And two, you are not going where they are. You're just waiting for them to come to you. And that's not how it works. And thank you so much yeah. for bringing that up, Jessica, to everybody listening to us. Um, you don't need to meet 100% of the criteria to apply for a job. Um, leave it at 60%, 65 apply for that job. Um, there is not a perfect candidate. They are looking for somebody who is willing to uh, know the rest. You bring some values, you bring some skills, some experience, and the rest you will learn during the job, or doing the job. Mm -hmm. But you just need to prove in the interview that you can actually learn the rest that you are missing or whatever skill you're lacking. But you could 100% apply to that job, even if you don't meet 100% of the criteria. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of um, HR com or I'm sorry, a lot of companies are relying heavily on HR and especially another um, 
buzzword topic a lot that we hear is DEI, right? Diversity, equity, inclusion. So you're seeing other kind of spinoff teams from HR that are literal task forces for just that. So they are take, they are starting to take a proactive approach in starting to market their jobs um, a little bit more diversely. Now, it definitely isn't, is you know, Rome wasn't built in a, in a day, right? It's definitely something that has taken time. We see a lot of corporations, especially big ones that don't, not I don't want to say don't care, but it's been a little bit longer of a stride um, for them to be a little bit more equitable and inclusive. Um, you know, that also kind of ties in line with like work-life balance and things of that nature as well. Um, but they're definitely starting, if you will. Definitely. Yep. Uh, love that thoughts, uh, Natalie. Thank you. Yep. And I would say one is having an accountability mechanism, you know, setting a, mm -hmm. certain, whether it's a, a metric or percentage, what have you, of the diverse representation you want to recruit and be intentional about. So I think on the on the back end, it's having that accountability mechanism of, OK, we need X percentage to be from the BIPOC community. And so that's the back end. But the front end is, and one of you all touched on it, is kind of being proactive and going about how you're going to be intentional in recruiting diverse, mm -hmm. underrepresented groups and people. And so a few mediums to do that is from a with within HR perspective, you can ensure that you have programs and initiatives set up directly to get in front of of diverse talent. And then also what you should do in, from an internal perspective is use the diverse talent that you have to go out to speak to different schools, different MBA programs, also different you know, organizations that aren't necessarily companies, if you will. So that's that's the first part of the question. And the second part of the question, in addition to diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think a big part of where we are now is that having that sense of belonging, feeling like you actually belong at the company because getting people there mm -hmm. is it's not enough. Yeah, I agree. From you said something you said something earlier about you said something earlier that was so great about if, if having a seat at the table is not enough. Hundred yeah. hmm. percent. Yeah. So that belonging factor is is something that's new and something that as has been stated, what we're doing right now isn't enough. But to you know, keep continue to raise the bar, that belonging effect needs to to take place and and be in effect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for answering that. Um, it's, it's, it's like um, uh, I hear two things from most of you. Um, accountability, being intentional about uh, mm -hmm. what is actually the goal on bringing in more underrepresented exactly. uh, professionals to, this, to the field. Uh, in, in, especially in technology, we feel so underrepresented. There's so much to be done. Um, here we are. We are all underrepresented. And we, we work for those big tech companies. And, and still we feel like there is so much to be done because we don't see in the upper level um, leading the company, you, you don't see a lot of people who look like you. And that doesn't make you feel included. Uh, being intentional about what is the goal in terms of um, hiring uh, underrepresented professionals and actually giving them the opportunity to, to jump the ladder, so, so to, to go um, to executive level positions. And second, also making sure that underrepresented professionals feel included because if they don't feel included sooner or later they, they will leave they wouldn't follow your mission so um to me it brings down to these points of, are we actually part of the um vp goals uh what are what are the vp goals mm -hmm. in terms of underrepresented professionals there has to be one vp goal uh on, on that regard and there has to be another vp goal that is actually aimed to bring more inclusiveness to the workplace. Um, I see companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook doing a lot of efforts in, in that. I, I wish those things um, take more notice uh, in the media because the more we bring awareness about these things, uh, the, uh, the easier it's gonna be for us to feel that like we're representing, like we belong there, like we're included, and the better are gonna be the products that we deliver to this world. Like they're gonna be actually what the world needs us to be working on because we mm -hmm. will be included, we will feel like we are part of this world. 
And uh, I, I, I wish to see more of this uh, news in, in, in the media, like people talking more about uh, what are the initiatives that Google is actually doing in terms of diversity and inclusion. I know that there are many, many of them. Amazon is doing a lot of efforts in terms of diversity and inclusion. Um, Facebook is also doing a lot of initiatives to bring more underrepresented professionals and to make sure they feel included. But those things actually don't take traction in the media. If these things start to take tra traction in the media, uh, more and more companies will be aware that they actually need to join these efforts. Um, so um, what, what are you things are the major barriers for uh, people underrepresented like us to break into technology? Uh, what were the major barriers that you face that we can actually use this knowledge to help others to get into technology today? I'm gonna start with Jessica. Perfect. Yeah. So I believe the first one is uh, the lack of representation. I mean, we have already talked about this and touched it very brief. Um, and I like to mention it, even though each day we have more representation and more people that we can look up to. For example, when I was uh, a teenager, um, I remember that I took a test back in Dominican Republic for where I'm from. And it was like aptitudes and aptitude. It was like just to tell you what type of career you should have studied in university. And I okay, got so holding look up to like as a list. But I didn't want to study engineering because there was no one that I knew that was a successful in you know a woman in engineering. So I was like, no, I just wanna I wanted to study advertising. And that's what I did. And I went on to study advertising and I joined the world of tech 10 years ago. So for me, that's like the first one. The more representation we have, the more um, we can lead by example to our kids. Then, of course, we have the, that we have a lack of education and, um, and access to resources. And yes, that is being solved. A lot of nonprofit organizations and a lot of institutions are working towards that. But we still have um, less access to resources as the more privileged counterparts have. Um, there is also bias and discrimination. I already mentioned this in the hiring process. Um, sometimes just because you come from a certain type of uh, school or if you just come from a boot camp, um, hiring managers will treat you differently because they don't think you have what they're looking for. So that either it is bias and non -bias, uh, sorry, uh, conscious and unconscious, um, that, that also affects us a lot. And lastly is the limited networking opportunities. Because for example, networking, it's a very important factor into breaking into tech. Like most of the jobs that I have gotten is because of networking. Most of my mm -hmm. friends have gotten jobs at big companies because of networking, because they were in the right place at the right time. But when yep. you don't have access to those type of events, then it's like, who are the ones who are going to get jobs? The ones who can have access to those events. So for me, if those are like blockers that I've seen working for the past 10 years, helping, you know, junior developers get their jobs and helping women break into tech, those are like some bullet points of what I've seen. Definitely. Great points, Jessica. Um, networking is key and, and uh, most of us have gotten into tech because we actually um, were referred by someone in our, in our network. Um, in my case, I got into tech because somebody gave me an opportunity to start. Uh, I had I graduated from my master's degree and I had no experience and I started as a junior business intelligence consultant. Um, is actually, um, you could get there by doing a specialization, a master's degree. You could get there by knowing somebody who works at Google, at Facebook, at uh, Amazon, and, and get referred. Um, that's that's uh, very important. Um, but uh, the barrier, the major barrier that we that we face when we are trying to break into the field is, like you mentioned, is feeling that like you are not part of it, like uh, you are not good mm -hmm. enough. And, and that's something that's an unconscious bias that we should remove uh, completely from from our mindset. Um, what do you think, Natalie? I agree. I think that lack of, you know, everything that we've all said as well, like lack of representation, seats at the table. Um, but to take it kind of a little deeper, like 
you know, once we've already broken into tech, you know, there are tons of barriers we receive, especially, you know, us as women, but it's also a part of like you, your, you yourself having the internal work to say, no, 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 I belong here. I'm supposed to be here. And I have to kind of push through, um, to, you know, kind of continue to make the impact and understand my why as to what I'm doing here and why I want my career to be in a certain way or the type of work that I'm working on and what I'm passionate about and things like that. Um, so while we face all of those things, underrepresentation, all of the things that we battle up against, um, I think that we also are responsible for how we react to certain things and the, the opportunities that were grant or given so that we can also turn around and be a beacon of making sure that we're helping under you know, our underrepresented brothers and sisters to make sure they can come in and making sure that the networking opportunities that we're a part of, we continue to post on the socials or we continue to make sure that our younger and more, I should say, financially inclined counterparts can be a part of these conversations in these organizations. Um, because if we've been as lucky as we, you know, we have been to get a seat at the table and actually be in some of these rooms, it's our responsibility as well to make sure that we pull other people along with us. I, I love that. I love that. I believe we, we, we have the chance to be here. Yeah. We, we have responsibility yes, for that. Yeah, like it's our responsibility. Course. Absolutely. Like we I, tapped in, we, you know, we, push through the, you know, like uh, Jessica, or Jessica mentioned such great things of like, you know, being underrepresented and like constantly, you know, like the networking piece is so key. Like it really is knowing the right person at the right time and being at the right lunch opportunity. And sure. it really is just that. And it's like, and if you find yourself in that position and you're like, you know what, I'm going to go to an event that I know certain people are going to be here and I've made it to certain points of my career. Well, you know, what? I'm going to call her and I'm going to make sure that that person knows and also like make sure that you put yourself in a position to help other people advance in their careers as well. Great. We not only break the barrier to be here, we need to mm -hmm. open doors for others. I love that. Mm -hmm. uh, every time somebody reaches out to me and says, Elvi, that was really helpful. I, I got the job. You know, that makes my day. That makes my day. I believe uh, mm -hmm. my mission here is, is in, on LinkedIn is to help as many people as I can to, mm -hmm. to break tech or to get inspired to break into tech because the mm -hmm. first thing that you face like somebody saying here is the imposter syndrome we feel mm -hmm. like we don't belong here and if we feel like we don't belong here that um we are actually not good enough we're not given we're not even going to try but we are mm -hmm. here and we are we are the the testimony and the example that it is possible and we we want to make uh this um uh, opportunity um, for other, we want to create opportunities for other and the representative, uh, the representative professionals like us. Um, Suri? Yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> you all have covered so much. Uh, I feel the the main points have been thus far three things, and two of them start with an R, representation, and then relationships. And then another I that, that was mentioned is imposter syndrome. And that's actually what I was going to was going to add. But another another topic that I, that starts with our eyes, the interview and interview preparation, because a lot of companies and I, I know mm -hmm. one for a specific example, going outside of the tech industry, the NFL, we have a rule where they have to interview a certain percentage of black head coaches. And so while that seems good, that's also a checkbox. So mm -hmm. in, in that yeah, interview, affirmative like, action. Exactly. So that's that's that. But taking it back to to the tech world and whether it's non-technical or technical, that interview is extremely hard. And so if you've broken the barrier of you know, the getting a referral, that will take you up until the interview. You're still gonna have an interview. So now that preparation for the interview is a huge barrier that we need resources for. And because we're not accustomed to, as a, as a culture, as a community, to the type of interviews that a lot of these tech companies have. And so it, if we're not accustomed to it, how can we then prepare for it versus our counterparts who have been in this industry, dominated this industry, and behind closed doors are helping Others, they're like my individuals get in and providing them resources. What where are the resources for those who are underrepresented in in, mm -hmm. in in this industry? And so I think 
the responsibility is on the corporation to provide specific resources. And it, in my opinion, it could be for everyone, but there needs to be specific resources that help, you know, workshops, different opportunities to upskill those who are not accustomed to interviewing in, in the tech industry. So I would say interview prep is also a barrier that, you know, everyone's, it's everyone's responsibility to help those who you refer get in and demystify Very their points. Very good points. Uh, I have helped many people to break into tech and uh, uh, I have figured the people that I have helped are people that are stuck because they cannot pass the interview. When I meet with them and I have an interview session with them and I start giving them a little bit of feedback, it's like um, it's like a wake up call in them. It's like a, an aha moment. They said, wow, and this is what I have to tweak in my response to get into tech. Yes, because we, we have a specific um, if it's specific answers that we are expecting from you. We, we want to. Most of these questions are behavioral. If they don't answer in a specific format, giving all the details and all the pieces that they need to provide in an interview, they don't get the job. Very good point, Zuri. Natalie, I, I saw you, you wanted to add something there, or Jessica? Jessica? I think Zuri covered it all, honestly. <laughs> I was nodding my head in agreement. <laughs> <laughs> great. Zuri has great points. He's he's right. It is. I think that not only do we have a social responsibility, you're absolutely correct. Organizations, if they are going to embark on this DEI journey of continuing to embrace diversity in their industries, they have a responsibility as well to make sure that it's fair for everyone. Um, to be able to understand and, and the, even the interview processes, like things like that, like just to get the job, like help me fix my resume, things like that, like very easy building block things make such a difference in someone's next career move. Um, so I totally agree. Yeah. And one last thing to add on that, as I was thinking through uh, my response, the resources, if you think about all of humanity, regardless of race, Providing providing the same resource to someone, that's equality. But for those in our community who aren't normally in these industries, we need extra resources. And that's where equity comes in. You know what I mean? So it's not it's not merely equality, because you see where equality got us, <laughs> but it's it's equity, providing what specific needs and resources does this one group need to at least have the the level the playing field be level so yeah very very good point um thank you suri for adding that um what changes would you like to see in the tech war jessica can we bring awareness uh, of um something that you believe that um should change in terms of diversity and inclusion in, in the tech industry i mean if you ask me we wouldn't finish today with everything that I want to see uh, changing. Um, so, I mean, the, the first thing that I want to see is to, of course, increase diversity and inclusion, hiring and promoting better practices. Um, so tech companies, so for example, like tech companies should work to actively recruit and hire diverse workforce. That's like the first thing that I want to see. Um, I also want to see more training for employees in terms of diversity and inclusivity, because it's not only to say it like, oh, yeah, we are the bells, we have the inclusion. It's like train your team so when diverse people join it, it will be easier for them and they won't have to struggle. That way you can retain um, better because one of the things like there is no... Um, I can say like, oh yeah, we we entered 50 new diverse employees, but then at the end of the year, I don't even have five because the work environment was not great for them. So training also your team to, to work into the, towards these practices for me is like another change that I want to see. The other thing, and this is happening in the, in the later year, we have a lot of um, uh, communities and organizations doing this, but more support for underrepresented groups, um, but actually coming from the tech companies. So it's not groups like Latinas in tech or Black in tech, but actually the tech companies 
um, providing support and resources for underrepresented groups, uh, such as like employee resource groups and mentorship programs, so they can also be part of this change. Because uh, it's not, like, again, it's not only to say here we are diverse, it's like, yes, and we are working towards these changes. Um, more things that I would like to see is more diverse leadership. I mean, <laughs> that's, I believe, something that we all want to see. Um, when you have diverse people on the top, then the bottom will be behave, let's say that, and they will actually work towards like, like, oh, I can make it to a VP, I can make it to a CEO, not only like, oh, yeah, I'm going to work in this, you know, low level jobs, they, it's something that more diverse people will aspire to be. And um, maybe the last one will be that just like more collaboration with organizations and initiatives. I already mentioned it come from the companies, but more help towards the organization that are actually making a change. Um, since I became part of the Latinas in Tech community, um, I uh, this is this is life changing. Seeing other people go through what you're going, seeing other people um, struggle with the same struggles that you have, it's not only there is a say in Spanish that's como que mal de muchos consuelo de tontos, which is like the more people going through the same thing, everyone gets like a consolation out of it. It. but it's like you can also get inspired because one person will do something different and then you'll be like oh then i will do that i will i will try that and that will work and then another more people will replicate that so more help towards this type of organization so also it's going to bring great changes to to you know to the tech world 100 yeah. percent. yep to add to your second to last point around leadership and heavy on leadership, heavy, right? <laughs> add, in, add in something super tangible and specific in an ideal world. And this is, in my opinion, we need to work towards full stop is every every senior executive. So your, your C-suite, your CMO, your CTO, your CEO, they should all have a direct report that is within the BIPOC community. That is something that, in my opinion, is, is non-existent today, maybe in, in some capacities at some companies, but overall, that is where I feel that the real decision-making processes will be changed to, to cater to the audience in which most of these tech companies serve. So that's the point on leadership. And the, the second and final point I'll, I'll touch on on this question is, is justice and i was at ad color a conference for people of color and creative industries and they had a conversation around diversity equity and inclusion but they all added j so they called it like jedi so justice then the j is justice but no i, I loved it because and i may not even be speaking to what they were looking at it as but the way i interpret it and synthesize it is tech companies have such power and position in the world and what if what if all of these tech tech companies showed up for those racial issues for those issues that need justice like that would be a, a major win for not only the tech companies but the, the those affected and so i think justice also needs to be added so we all can be jedis pun intended yeah. <laughs> Well, you're you're right, but I'll even challenge a little further. Like, I don't te technically work for a technology firm. I work for an H. I work for a human capital management firm, and there is a lot of us in technology that are in tech, but not necessarily working for a technology company. Um, so I think if we just have, to your point, a fraction, just a drop in the bucket, right? Like, imagine how much change could be, right? I mean, it, that goes way by it could you, even just the human environment, right? Like when you just recycle and pick up after yourself, imagine what if one person does that 100 and 200 and 1,000. So there's power in numbers for sure. Great point. I think you're on mute. Yeah, we yeah. can't hear you, LV. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> I, you hit the nail on that. Uh, we need to see more people like us leading uh, these tech companies. Uh, I, um, 
I was very um, happy when I saw that uh, there is a women CEO recently uh, leading Slack. Uh, mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, very powerful for all of us. She's from Brazil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So kudos to her for going to the CIO level and uh, leading uh, Slack. Um, it's, it's definitely uh, a big step forward for, for us uh, as underrepresented professionals in technology. Uh, seeing people like us leading the way is, 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 is the way that we are looking forward to see, to see those changes happening. And uh, uh, definitely, um, if these companies are more intentional in bringing more people in tech, we want to see tangible actions. We don't, we just don't want to hear talking about it. We, we want to mm -hmm. see that, that this is happening. The change that I want to see is like, I want um, diversity and inclusion and belonging and equity, not, not just be a subject that we discuss, but uh, something that I see tangible actions. I see like... Um, we actually are committed to hire 1,000 underrepresented professionals per year. Uh, this is what I want to see. And at the end of the year, I want to see those 1,000 coming in on board uh, in those big tech companies. And uh, wh what can we do to open doors for other professionals in technology like us? So what, what things would you recommend to somebody trying to break into tech? I'll take that one. Oh. You're on mute. Thank you, Thank you. <laughs> I, Natalie. I know it's like the proverbial like since 2020, we've all been on mute, guys. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> not not use the mute, the mute button for Natalie, now. You can take it. Don't worry. Don't um, I I advise a lot of people to start your basic, like, you know, for example, I, I touched upon this a little earlier. A lot of, a, a lot of you can already pivot into tech simply by moving to more technological roles within your own organization, right? No, no matter what industry you're in, you can be in cars, you could be, you know, building toys. There's going to be some technological, co technological component to every aspect, any industry, right? At this day and age. So I think that sometimes it's very, it's a lot easier than people think to pivot um, especially if you're already in, in an industry that is already offering more kind of like maybe business analyst roles or something that helps you kind of like softly transition into a more technical role. Um, so that is always like my first bit of advice of like start asking questions like, where do you work? What are you doing today? Like, OK, well, let's take a look at where you are at and what open positions they may have before start moving into, you know, like, OK, taking the big leaps to go moving into like big tech firms. Um, so that's that's one way. Very good point. Very good point. Um, uh, networking, basically. Uh, network with people who are already mm -hmm. who you are. Mm -hmm. um, I will add to that preparation. Preparation. I, I, I kept doing certifications one after another until I, I feel like I was actually um, prepared for, for tackling an, an interview to show off my skills in, in, a, in a resume. Preparation can take you along the way. If you are not there right now, Look at the job description for your dream job and look at the skills that you are lacking and start preparing yourself for those skills. Look at main, find a mentor and uh, also um, start taking those certification courses or whatever you believe that you are lacking. And there are a lot, a lot of Google certifications that are actually done for free right now that Google is giving away. And there are a lot, a lot of courses online that you can take at, at, for, for free, basically. Um, Jessica, I saw that you wanted to add your insights. Yes, of course. So I am so ha happy that you started with networking because for me, that's like the first and most important one that people should do. So I 100% uh, agree with that. Also, it's never too late to seek out education and training opportunities. So I've seen people, I, I run a boot camp, well, uh, an academy type of boot camp. And uh, I saw a lot of people in their 40s and 50s just seeking new education. So if breaking into tech means that you want to be a software developer, don't hesitate, join a bootcamp, join uh, an academy and go for it. Because a lot of people are like, oh, I'm too old for that. No, you're not. Um, it, it, it is the right time when it is the right time. So just go for it. Um, also, uh, once you're done, once you're trained, once you know what you want to do, look for internships or entry-level positions. Um, 
yes, I know that in a lot of um, cases, uh, depending on what life you are leading, having an entry level position, it's kind of hard because of, you know, money wise. But if you can make that, um, let's say, sacrifice, do it because uh, entry level positions will open a lot of doors and will help you network and meet other people that can help you. Um, and lastly, consider seeking out um, mentorships. Um, I am a mentor for startups. I am a mentor for Latinas in tech. And finding a mentor who can provide guidance and support can be incredibly helpful as you navigate this career change. Um, so there are a bunch of programs that uh, you can look out and reach out to. Also, I know that some tech companies and some organizations have this type of programs. So consider seeking out mentorship because um, one, it will help you with networking, meeting someone that can, you know, basically tell you what path to take or how to address it. And what I love about mentorship is that it's not telling you exactly what to do, but it's, you know, helping you analyze which way it's better. So mm -hmm. that will be my recommendation. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, uh, Zudi? Yep, I can add in how I approach this is ways that all of us on, on stream can help others break into tech. And for me, it boils down into three things. And the first being the resume and thinking of the resume as a resume, but going mm -hmm. deeper as far as experiences. You know, we, if you're mentoring someone or speaking with someone and you know that they want to do you know, X job and you look at X job description for them and you communicate to them, okay, these are the experiences and the skills that you need to be competitive for, for this world. Point of experiences or different trainings they can take different certifications they could be certified in. And so that's the first point. And then the second point in, in which we can do, and we kind of touched on this, is, is those relationships, right? Connecting them. If you're talking to someone that's a software engineer, and you're a software engineer, what software engineers can connect them with? And whatever, whatever function, whatever business area, if you're not in that area, and even if you are, connecting them, being that bridge of connection to, to that particular person that's trying to break in tech to people who are already in tech knowing what it is that they want to do. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing, I mean, it's, it's nothing new, but this is very important, is, is the referral, making sure that they mm -hmm. are referred. And so and, and now nowadays, especially for big tech, you want to make sure that you have a referral because there's thousands of applications. So there could be one hiccup in your application that you may not even be seeing without a, a referral. So those will be the things where I feel like we can all help you know, insert person, help them break into tech by helping them with their resume, connecting them to Thank new you. relationships and referring them. Totally, totally agree. Um, I hear networking. I hear uh, that you mentioned about training, um, uh, people who keep preparing themselves, getting certifications is a great way. I hear preparing themselves for the interview. Um, we could uh, continuously provide resources for them. Um, what can we, um, I, in my, for, for my case, I'm, I'm trying to post uh, helpful content on LinkedIn to help my audience to to see that it is possible or to actually get some insights into how they can break into tech. Um, there are many, many things that we can do, but um, what is one thing that um, you believe that you would like to do to help others to break into tech? Um, sometimes we cannot refer. Um, right now we are in a hiring freeze uh, and, and that's another uh, thing, thing that we are gonna face. So any final recommendations or thoughts for somebody trying to break into tech right now? Right now is probably one of the challenging times that we are actually facing. Some big tech companies are uh, doing layoffs. So what is your final thoughts and recommendations for somebody trying to break into tech right now? Any final thoughts and recommendations? 
I think that we need to get creative, right? Like it's already been established that big technology companies like Fang and all of those, they're in there. It's it, that is established as a factual statement that they are struggling and they're, they're, they're having massive layoffs, right? So it's time to get creative and not necessarily go after huge technology firms and maybe hone in on the type of industry you want to work for. And a lot of times we go into tech because it's sexy and it sounds fun and the money's great, but then you're stuck building product for things that, or being part of initiatives, right? For things that you don't necessarily are passionate about. You're building, let's say you're building products for things that just don't drive you or are kind of boring, very, you know, old school thinking, and you just don't want to be doing it. You want to be in the makeup industry or you want to be working with cars or at Formula One, you know, like I think it's time to really put your critical thinking skills to test and understand where you want to be and find a role that fits into that world um, and stay away from big tech companies for right now is my recommendation. I love that, Natalie. Great, great insights there. Um, uh, yeah. Totally, uh, that, I totally agree with that. And also is that um, everyone is very anxious about what's going on right now, but I see it with a different pair of eyes. For example, yeah. the reason most, most big companies are having these massive layouts, it's not because they, have, they don't have the money. It's because they realize they overhired during the last five yeah. years. Yes. If you remember, Facebook, Google, Apple, Twitter were fighting, and Amazon too, they were fighting over their senior staff and mid-level staff. It was like, mm -hmm. I am, a lot of people went up uh, and got promotions by changing companies. They didn't even need it. A lot, I have a lot of friends that got into one team and they were just sitting there without any project being assigned to them for months because they, companies just wanted to hire so they could show off that they have the, the most senior staff, the more experienced staff, mm -hmm. but there were actually no projects to work on. So now because they realize that and the economy is getting kind of tight after COVID and after everything that is going on, it's like, whoa, wait, what, what about all those people who are sitting on the bench? They're doing nothing. So they had to lay off. And I knew that this was going to happen because like four months ago, mm -hmm. I think it was, um, Mark Zuckerberg in one very private Facebook, uh, you know, meta event for only employees, he actually took the microphone and said, a lot of you know you shouldn't be here. So that we knew that that was going to come. And once one big company started firing people, the other ones realized like, oh, well, maybe we should do the same. So, so that's when it started. But the opportunity here is that a lot of startups has been struggling in recruiting recruiting people for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I've been working with startup for like the past 10 years. And the number one issue that startup have is because they don't have access to good talent. Because of course, when a developer can join your company for 120 a year, but Twitter is offering half a million dollars a year, who do you think he's going to pick? Of course, he's <laughs> going to go after the money. He's going to go to Twitter. But now all this talent that is being laid off can actually you know, go and join startups that are looking for talent, that are amazing, that are doing great things. Um, and now basically there is this opportunity. opportunity. So I agree with Nalari being like, hey, do not focus on, on main fan or whatever we want to call them. Let's focus on small startups that are making an impact, that have open positions and that can pay you well because they are also needing that talent. Amazing insight. You have to get creative. You have to get creative and it, it allows you to really understand what you're passionate about. Like there's so many startups to your point, Jessica, and I'm sure you come in line with so many amazing ideas where you'd actually feel fulfilled every day going to work. And those, those startups uh, become big companies because remember, Amazon, Facebook, Google, they all started from startup. So um, it's, it's actually having that vision. If you work for something that you have passion for and um, you keep uh, building that experience that uh, regardless of the company that you are working on, you're actually building your resume. You're building your work body of work. You're building your, your work experience. And um, I, I have seen a lot of people that just graduated from college and they believe that they want to jump in, in, in into a big tech company. Perhaps this is not the best thing that can happen to them. 
they need to build uh, some experience before actually going into into a big company. Um, what do you think, Zuri? Yeah, it goes back to what Nelly said as far as getting creative. And what I would say in this time right now where for whomever, as we all alluded to, it's it's a tough time to break in. So folks switching your mindset on, okay, this actually is giving me time to build the experience that I need to get the training and the education that I need. So in, in the spirit of getting creative, what I would say is create the experience that you don't have. You know, within tech, within a technology industry, you can do a, a tech role or a non-tech role. So taking, for example, someone who wants to do, let's say, marketing within within the technology industry, and they want to do within marketing, social media marketing. To get ex to gain experience in that, you can reach out to maybe someone who is who is where you want to be, who is in tech, maybe a, a leader, a middle manager in tech. You could ask them, could you run their social media channels? And so that's literally tangible experience that you got creative with, but now you have experience with social media marketing. So that's a skill, but that also on your resume can be a an experience. So that's what I would say, get creative, create your own experiences by doing projects and taking on different initiatives to help you get to, to tech. Definitely. Uh, love your insights. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, and this was amazing, amazing discussion. So for anyone who is trying to break into tech, this is the moment to take a step backward, like Natalie said, and think about what you want to do for your career. Uh, probably it's not the time to try to break the ladder and go into a big company. Uh, it's the time to focus on what is what is what what is your industry? What do you want to focus on? Where do you how can you gain the experience that is going to help you to get there tomorrow? Probably uh, the answer is a startup. Perhaps the answer is a consulting company. There are a lot of consulting companies actually uh, creating opportunities that actually can send you to a big tech company as a contractor and you gain the experience that you need. I highly recommend people to look into consulting as well. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. I'm going to be answering. We're going to be answering your questions over the chat. It's been amazing to have Jessica, Natalie, and Suri today. Thank you, thank you to all of you who joined us. Uh, this has been a pleasure. Wishing you all the best these holidays and um, see you next time. Thank you. Bye, Bye guys. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you to all of you. Bye, Merry Christmas. That's right, happy, happy holidays. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.